Welcome to the Own It Paracast, the place to be when you get serious about making big changes and accelerating growth in your life and in your relationships. Finally create the life you've always wanted, living life on your own terms. Learn how to take your fear and turn it into powerful choices that will create sustained change. Now your host, Mary Baker. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Own It Powercast, a place where you can come to get what you need to move yourself forward. Hey, it's Mary Baker and welcome to episode 66, Anxiety and Boundaries. So as you know, this month we're focusing on stress and anxiety, which of course is a timely topic given what is going on all around us. Well, today I want to talk about the strong connection between anxiety and boundaries, or actually a lack thereof. So if you're not familiar with boundaries already, then I encourage you to go back and check out episodes 10 through 18, where we explore all of that. But essentially, right, boundaries define where we end and others begin. I also think that they help us define reality And what I mean by that is that there's 24-7, that there's seven days in a week, that some people might say no to us, that we're only one person and can only do so much at one time. And part of that reality, and I think one of the first areas that I want to look at in terms of the connection between boundaries and anxiety is conflict. So what anxiety can really be about is being conflict averse. You just don't want to start any problems with anybody. You don't want an argument. You don't want people upset with you. You don't want to rock the apple cart. All of those ways one can look at it. It's all the same thing. We don't like conflict. You know, and like we've talked about before, maybe you had terrible experiences as a child. You know, either you witnessed or were a part of awful conflict that was either scary or abusive. And Remember, if you were four or five and mom and dad were just fighting and yelling all the time, there didn't have to be physical abuse for that to feel very unsettling and very scary, okay? Because you didn't feel safe and you didn't know when it was going to blow up again. So maybe you witnessed conflict and said, I don't want any of that anymore in my life. On the other end of the spectrum, your family could have been very passive and didn't deal with anything. At least the people who are fighting were being more emotionally honest, right? But the people who don't talk about their feelings and God forbid express them are very passive and or passive aggressive families. So that paradigm is all about putting things under the rug, pretending nothing ever happened last night. They don't know how and they don't deal with things directly. They don't even talk about what happened the next morning. And so what that does is shows you that we don't deal with things directly. Now, what will happen is a lot of triangulation in these families where they'll talk to you about him or her, but they won't talk to him or her directly, or you will not be confronted directly either. You'll hear about it from others. And we've talked before about just how dangerous and corrosive and emotionally unsafe this can be. Okay, so think about how much anxiety is created just by that, just by triangulation. So I'm not going to go down deep into all the millions of dynamics that you could have found in your early childhood. I just want to touch on some of them here. So if you are conflict averse, well, that's going to create anxiety, right? Because what happens if you have to ask for what you need or say no to someone Well, that's not going to go over well. So rather than do that, you probably suck it up and put one more thing on your plate or cause a lot of stress on your end that oftentimes other people aren't even aware of because you never spoke anything to them about it. This wasn't modeled for you, right? Like we were just talking about in a passive family, they didn't model that. They just modeled hanging on the cross, They didn't model confronting the neighbor about dumping their leaves in your backyard. Instead, dad would just be all stressed out and frustrated. Well, great. Now I have to spend an extra hour cleaning up his leaves kind of thing. That's what was modeled to you. And the other piece to this that can be modeled, taught, or received in some way, shape, or form is maybe you were punished. Maybe you were punished in some emotional or psychological or maybe even physical way for speaking up. Okay. 
for saying no, for asking for what you need, for saying your sister stealing your clothes wasn't fair. You know, maybe you were punished just for speaking your mind, having a dissenting opinion, asking for what you need. You got the sense that having and setting boundaries out loud was selfish, uncaring, how could you, how dare you? So can you see why you might not want to risk conflict if you're going to be treated like that? Because that's very imprinting for a kid. That only has to happen a couple of times to form some really distorted beliefs. And speaking about beliefs, that's what we're talking about today. And I hope you can kind of see that, oh, so we're creating paradigms and belief systems that are based on what we were taught or what was modeled. But what I want you to do today is figure out, is that really valid? Is that very healthy? Why or why not? Or is it even true? Okay. In other words, you're seeing here a lot of externalization, right? It's very fear-based. It's all about them. It's all about their circumstances. It's all about feeling responsible for circumstances and people and places outside of your control. We've talked about this. And at the core of this is the fear of abandonment, right? The fear that you're going to be rejected. You're going to be hated. You will have love withdrawn. You will be ostracized. You'll be a horrible person because God forbid you said no, or you asked for what you needed, or you said, I'm sorry, I thought I had time to do that today, but I really just don't. Some things just blew up at home and I just can't do it. Unhealthy people will give you a rash of you-know-what for that. Healthy people, they may be disappointed, but they're not going to try to make you feel like crap for taking care of yourself. A healthy person would say, absolutely, do what you need to do to take care of yourself. I'm fine. So the shoulds, the have-tos, feeling responsible for other people's reactions, feeling responsible for other people being upset, feeling responsible for other people's behavior, You know, a lot of times we're rescuing people from things they ought to be doing for themselves or consequences they really ought to be facing for themselves, and we're not. And so that's going to create anxiety right then and there. And it's going to put more on you because now you're not only trying to manage your own life not very well, you're trying to manage someone else's life not very well. But see, in the family, they would say, how could you say no to your sister? How selfish can you be? Right? She needs you. She needs help right now. What's wrong with you? Now, of course, no one's talking about how your sister got herself into this mess in the first place, right? And how the family often wants to rescue her at your expense, because you're the one who has your shit together. You're the one who's responsible. You're the one who has worked hard and never asked for anything. You couldn't ask for anything growing up. There was only so much bandwidth the family had. And you knew after her, there wasn't going to be much left for you. Someone had to be the good child. Someone had to keep themselves off the radar. But do you see how toxic that is? Do you see how untrue that is? That what is for your sister's highest good is for people to stop rescuing her, let her fall down, let her pick herself back up, and maybe finally, finally, right, get some boundaries and feel good about herself because that rule applies to all of us, including her. So in other words, the message is all about the should, 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 should. It's all about your distorted beliefs around what should be, how you should be, what you should think and feel, what you should or shouldn't do. Should is fear-based. Now, I want to step aside for a moment. There are some good character building shoulds. There's a few out there. They're about what you learned as a kid in terms of being respectful, share your toys, think of others. Absolutely. But the rule of thumb is you don't think of others when you're rescuing them. That's different. That's not thinking of them. That's thinking of us. We talked about that before. And thinking of others is supposed to be for their highest good and rescuing is not. And thinking of others is a choice. So that's where I think the social messages of shame, especially in certain cultures, it's stronger than in others, where that would keep you from doing the wrong thing. And remember, healthy guilt, 
will correlate to behavior change. Not feeling like crap about yourself, which is shame. So the shoulds are not good. Stop shoulding all over yourself, right? When you have a situation and you think, oh, God, I really don't have time to do that. I want you to think for a moment, is it selfish or would it be horrible if I said no? Because it's what we have attached to it that matters. We've explored that before here. It's what I have attached to saying no. That's the kicker, right? Because if I grew up in a healthy family where people were allowed to say no in in a very loving and gracious way with a nice statement, and it was looked upon as, yes, that is a better thing for you to do. Other people said no as well. That became the norm. But if I grew up in an unhealthy family where people were afraid to say no, and here or no, because they're one and the same, I'm going to create the belief that saying no is mean, it's selfish, and it's uncaring. What I also want you to know is it blurs the boundary between where you end and others begin. That's a mess. And I swear, deep down, I think that even on an unconscious level, when we feel like we are blurred with other people, conjoined perhaps, we're going to have anxiety because you can't, you can't define the self. How do you do that? If your time is not your own, if your needs are not your own, if your money is not your own, if your body is not your own, talk about boundary blur. How in the world can you have ownership of yourself and feel grounded and confident? So looking at our beliefs, thoughts are things, beliefs make them so is a phrase. It is said that beliefs are thoughts that I think often they get cemented, they get reaffirmed because of circumstances and things that happen, especially early in life. The earlier, the more imprinting, right? So learning where your beliefs came from is really helpful and working on changing them. Because here's the deal. Either we begin to say no to others and to detach with love and honor ourselves, or We got to take responsibility for owning our own damn anxiety, right? We can't put that on other people. And that may piss you off and make you irritated. But remember, today we have a choice and we need to own the choice. Because anxiety is all fear-based, what I would say, compulsive behavior. We even do it without even thinking about it. But that's going to keep us right where we are because we're out of control, because we're focused on what we can't control. And deep down, we know that. We feel anxious and stressed because we know somewhere deep down, we can't make stuff really happen. But we keep striving and trying, don't we? Keeping that focus out there, ignoring ourselves. See, the convenient part of that is that way you can tune out from what you're really feeling, what you really need in the moment, what's really infuriating you right now. And anxious people are often ones who don't own their anger. I've had clients flat out tell me, yeah, I can't do that. They often grew up with horrific abuse, and I can certainly have compassion as to why. They don't want to even connect with any kind of anger at all. Speaking of being out of control, another area we want to look at is internal boundaries. You know, earlier we just talked about all the external boundaries, dealing with people out there, dealing with circumstances outside of ourselves. Internal boundaries are self-discipline a favorite topic of boundary loving people, a not so favorite topic of people who struggle with it. So if you struggle with procrastination, you struggle with hearing no, because it feels like rejection from others. If you struggle with not getting things done, being able to follow through on time, then you probably struggle with self-discipline. If you struggle with any compulsive behaviors, You know, eating too much when you're upset, not taking care of yourself, gaming for hours, all these addictive type behaviors. A lot of that is a boundary issue. You don't have self-discipline. If you put pleasure before getting your stuff done, lack of the ability to defer gratification, then you struggle with internal discipline. If your boundaries have ever been violated growing up, you probably will struggle with self-discipline. That's a whole nother session, but I just wanted to acknowledge that. If you were given shaming messages about yourself, 
that you were disorganized because you didn't do it perfectly, because maybe you didn't get A's like your brother. So therefore, you were a disorganized student. And even though deep down, you really weren't right. But if you were given shaming messages about all the stuff that you were quote unquote, not capable of, Oh, you internalized that and probably are playing it out by procrastinating, by sabotaging things at the 11th hour, by settling for less than what you would normally do if you were proud of yourself. So I want you to think about that too. You know, some of these could be beliefs you internalized about yourself that aren't even true. You know, when I work with young people and teenagers, it always fascinates me how at home they're a mess. They won't clean their room. They won't, you know, study. They, they won't conform. And yet they'll go to camp or they'll go to some other highly, I mean, highly structured environment and thrive. I'm like, wow, okay, what's that about? What that tells me is those structured environments, as long as they're loving and caring, right? They're not brutal. They thrived because they had trust and they were believed in. Those people didn't look at them when they walked in the door and said, um, you probably can't follow the rules, but here they are anyway. No, they assumed the best. And then my clients rose to meet that bar. So that's an important concept that I think we want to just remember. So self-discipline, internal boundaries. This is where we accept the reality that guess what? Only 24 hours in a day, seven days a week, I don't get extra. I don't get more than you. It's where I think we often create a lot of our own chaos and therefore our own anxiety. Because when we have more self-discipline, when we say no to the cookies because we want to get healthier, we are more grounded and we have healthy control. When we get our money straight, when we have a budget, a budget is a set of boundaries, right? It says where you can spend money and where you can't and that it's finite. You can't just go take out another credit card. And when you abide by those boundaries, you live within your means. Do you see how that math works? It means we're not trying to do five things at once anymore. I want to stop you for a moment. Oftentimes, you're overwhelmed and you're stressed and you're anxious. And guess what? Secretly angry at the world, right? But they don't know that because you're hiding it. It's because you put too much on your plate. Because you didn't get real and say, oh, you know, I'm probably not going to get all that done today. And that's okay. Maybe I just need to tell them, I'm sorry, I can't volunteer this year. I can't do that for you. If, 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 if I'm going to have time to actually get the things done that absolutely need to be done because. So when we're not saying no when we pick up the phone, when we're in the middle of trying to cook dinner and manage three kids, what are we doing? Just because your sister's upset and she wants you to hear her 11th sob story of the week because she can't keep herself out of messes, you're going to be flustered and frustrated. Dinner's not going to get cooked on time. The kids are going to be stressed out. You're going to be anxious and angry. And here we go. All because you picked up the phone. All because you were so afraid that you'd be a horrible sister if you didn't. You also could have picked up the phone and said, hey, are you okay? And if no one was bleeding and it was not a 911, you could say, hey, can I call you back in about two hours? I just got a lot going on right now. There's a third option. It doesn't have to be black and white. We can touch base with people really quick and say, hey, this is just not a great time. We can risk disappointing them, God forbid, right? We can let them know the truth, the truth. Hopefully you're listening today and you're understanding, oh, this is all about getting honest. This is about me accepting the truth and telling the truth to others and risking them being upset. Telling the truth to myself is all what self-discipline is, I think. That's the way I look at it for myself. And I struggle with aspects of this for years. I didn't want the reality. I was afraid of it, maybe. Maybe I wouldn't be able to get as much done as I thought. We're learning to say no to chaos, yes to order, yes to simpler, yes to less, less to deal with, less to try to manage and coordinate and put away and clean up and deal with and take care of. Less worry about what is unfinished and what is unresolved. 
Those are two huge issues that clients talk to me about every week. What is unfinished and what is unresolved? The things that are not finished, the degree they never finished because they put their partner first, the project they didn't finish, the work they didn't finish because they allowed themselves to get pulled away. You can't feel good about yourself when you have three unfinished projects going on. You didn't complete it. You didn't follow through and do what you said you wanted to do for your because. Your relationships struggle probably a lot because of this too, right? Because people can't count on you to finish it. You can't count on yourself. Unresolved hurts that maybe we need to talk to our spouse about because we're carrying this resentment and they don't know. They just know we've kind of pulled away, right? Unresolved that we have an issue that needs to be worked through and some boundaries need to be established. Like maybe your adolescent needs to hit the sack a little earlier because they can't get up in the morning and you're having to stop and try to drag them out of the bed when you're supposed to be at work. We are learning to prioritize and thus also choose what must wait. We can't have it right now. I sound like a kid when I say that, right? Well, guess what? That's where the emotional maturity level is in terms of delayed gratification. Those of you with kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Saying no, being the bad guy, saying ice cream after dinner, not before. You can go outside and play once you've cleaned your room and done your homework. Delayed gratification and learning to be okay with it. We're learning to be okay with letting things wait. The outcome's going to be fine. Do you see we're just like attached to this outcome? Or maybe things just need to be let go of and they'll be fine too. Maybe we can deal with those things tomorrow. This is all about, as you can see, letting go of the outcome in trade for doing the right thing instead. Taking care of first things first, right? Because most of all, guys, you can see this. We are learning to finally, finally trust ourselves more. Huge. Stop right there. Can you see the connection between that and lower levels of anxiety? Because if you're working on this, you're going to feel more grounded. Now, I want to stop for a moment and talk about the huge price if we don't work on this. Let me hammer this home, okay? So if we have loose boundaries... You're going to become more obsessed about the fear of what you can't get done, more obsessed about what others are doing or not doing, and so on and so forth. You cannot be emotionally present and happy in your relationships. You can't. We got to pick one. We're either all caught up in whatever, whatever, or we're grounded and peaceful and calm and open and vulnerable. Let's talk about the big physical toll. We've mentioned this before in other episodes, migraines, panic attacks, stress on your body means stress on your organs. It's a direct connector to illness. We know this. So you're making your body pay because your body's feeling all the feelings you will not sit with. Your body is in fight or flight mode constantly. All these stress hormones, all this mess going on in your body not good. People pay for that dearly later on. You trust yourself less, right? Because you can't say no and you can't hear no. So your anxiety goes up. And guess what? Gets better, right? Then we project all this stress onto others because we're irritable and we're perfectionistic and we're secretly so pissed at ourselves, but we can't look at that. We project it onto them and get all frustrated when they're not doing things on time and perfectly because they're not saying no to things. Hmm, take a look at that for a moment. And the biggest price, I think, is that you lose yourself in situations and relationships and eventually lose you. Guys, I sit with people every week where this has happened, either quickly or slowly and insidiously over the years, but it happens. Because you disconnect from your truth, right? What I mean by that is you disconnect from your feelings, your needs, your dreams, because it's all become about others' feelings, needs, and dreams, and it isn't even their fault. This is the boundary blur I'm 
talking about here. All right, so there's the cost. Again, to reiterate the benefits, you're going to feel calmer, you're going to feel more grounded, you're going to have more discipline, you're going to have less chaos in your house, in your heart, and in your life. You won't be spinning as much. You'll be internally focused, not focused so much out there. You're going to be in choice. You're going to start feeling good about your choices. You're going to have priorities. They're going to be values and beliefs based. And by the way, those beliefs are going to make sense. They're going to be based in reality. They're going to be healthy beliefs. You're going to work on boundaries and detachment and your anxiety is going to go down. Because I can promise you, better boundaries may seem like it's more anxiety at first. That's okay, because you're getting ready to really take a risk. But believe me, it will begin to feel better, safer, calmer over time. The anxiety will go down. It's just like anything else. You have a big problem, and it's scary to pull the big trigger because you need a big trigger to kill the big problem. But then once you do it, there's relief on the other side, right? Because you tackled it. Better boundaries will help you have calmer, healthier relationships. Be a lot less conflict, guys. Might be more in the very beginning as people get used to hearing you say no. But you know what? They'll be fine. They will live. And actually, the stress will go down. You'll be walking around a lot less pissed off. You'll have less chaos, more peace, more self-trust. You will, in turn, give others more compassion more peace, more joy, and more connection. You'll be a far more patient person. All right, so how do we work on this? Let's talk about this before we go. So one of the first things I encourage you to do, which you probably have already started doing this as you're listening today, is create awareness. Think about where you really truly are in a loving way, but in an honest way. You know, how am I doing? How am I doing with boundaries? Where is my anxiety, by the way? If there are loved ones in your life, you can do the same thing too, right? Not that you're trying to fix them, but you're trying to understand, oh, that's why. That's why my partner gets so flustered and gets irritable with me because they struggle with boundaries. So create awareness first about what's going on. Then journal about what you struggle with. You know, what are your emotions? What do you think your fear-based beliefs are? All that stuff. What's going on in your life today that feels overwhelming and unmanageable? It is most helpful if you can share this with another healthy soul. That's really important. If you can't, just journal it. At least talk to yourself about it first. Then I want you to look at some of the possible origins. Here, just be really compassionate with yourself. You know, speaking of boundaries, guys, you're not responsible for the big setup of growing up. You have choices today, but you didn't have a whole lot of choices about how you got here. So be nice. This is not the time to beat yourself over the head. Then start making a list of a few boundary areas that maybe you can start working on. And most of us start small, and I encourage that you get little accomplishments under your belt, you're going to feel a hell of a lot stronger and more empowered and and ready to take on the bigger challenges. Get a good coach or a counselor if you have some big boundary problems here that you need to walk through. If you have trauma in the past, definitely do not try to walk through that by yourself. We're not supposed to. Get someone safe, a professional to talk to and walk through it with you. And finally, practice a little bit at a time, tweak things, change things. Be kind yet firm with yourself, right? Because remember, get that choice statement going like, okay, I can be stressed out and tear my hair out today, or I can sit down for a moment and figure out, okay, where are the boundary issues? Because if I sit here long enough with this, oh, I will find them. They will show themselves. Okay, so today we talked about the connection between having anxiety and lots of stress and perhaps a lack of boundaries. And we talked about those boundaries can be with others, you know, having a hard time saying no and asking for what we need. They can also go hand in hand, and they normally do, with having a lack of self-discipline. And we can be anywhere on that continuum, by the way, guys. 
And so the self-discipline issue means we probably procrastinate, we pile on, we try to do too much at one time, we're not organized, we're not saying no to some things, we're not prioritizing, okay? And self-care is giving yourself time every week to sit down and lay out your week too. And that's a boundary issue too. That's telling yourself, okay, Sunday night, I need 20 minutes if I don't want a week of chaos. Okay. So thank you for joining me today. I hope this was helpful. If it was, please pass it along to those you know. May you stay healthy, grounded, full of wonderful boundaries, right? And hold on to hope. Keep focusing on the good in yourself and other people. Please be sure to check the show notes at ownitpowercast.com to sign up for the newsletter if you don't already get it every Tuesday. And check out the Facebook group. You can find that in the newsletter. Go in there and join. It's a small but comfortable group. We're there for you. So pay it forward. Keep focusing on you. And I'll see you next time. We hope you took away some useful insights and tools you can begin using right away. If you did, please leave a positive review and share on your social media. Because could you imagine if everyone in your life really got it together? Remember, own it now, so you can really own it later.